Segment 5b, Eclipses and Tides. Eclipses of both the Sun and the Moon and the tidal phenomena that we can see on the world's oceans are two of the most prominent interactions of the Earth and the Moon. And today we're going to talk about both of them and explain how they come about and some of the reasons why we're interested in them and, uh, and some of the, the side effects of these, these various phenomena. So we've talked about the moon passing behind the Earth, there being, being on the opposite side of the Earth and the sun, and being on the side of, of the Earth towards the sun. And you might expect then, if they were all in a line, that you'd have an eclipse every two weeks, once a, first a solar eclipse and then a lunar eclipse. But this doesn't happen because the orbit of the moon is tipped by a small amount with respect to the orbit of the Earth around the sun, to the ecliptic plane inclination of the moon's orbit is about five degrees and this means that most of the time the moon which is not terribly large is either slightly above or slightly below the ecliptic plane and so the moon casts its shadow past the earth or the earth casts its shadow past the moon and it's only when the moon crosses the ecliptic plane when it's in a line with the sun. So if that line A to B in the top illustration is pointing towards or away from the sun, that we get an eclipse. There are two types of eclipses that you know about. One is a solar eclipse and the other is a lunar eclipse. A solar eclipse is when the moon blocks the light from the sun from reaching the earth. And a lunar eclipse is when the moon passes into the Earth's shadow. So if you were standing on the moon, you would see the sun blocked by the Earth. That's what's illustrated in this lower illustration here. So solar eclipse, the moon blocks sunlight. Lunar eclipse, the Earth blocks sunlight. This is just an illustration of what happens on the, on the left during a lunar eclipse, the moon passing along its orbit passes through the Earth's shadow, and there are two parts of the Earth's shadow, and we won't go into any of this kind of detail when we ask questions about this. There's the penumbra, which is the outer part of the shadow, and then the umbra. Umbra comes from the Latin word for shadow, and that's the part where the moon is, is fully in the shadow and no part of the sun is visible. So you see a total lunar eclipse when the moon passes into the, the umbra part. On the right, you see a picture of the moon during a total eclipse of, of the moon, a total lunar eclipse. It, it may seem kind of odd to you to, to, to actually see a picture of something that's completely in shadow, but in fact this is possible because sunlight from the sun streams through the Earth's atmosphere and some of it is scattered and illuminates the moon. That's the reason for the red color. It's kind of like when you look at the sun close to sunset and it looks very red. Here the whole moon looks red because all the light is essentially sunset light that's getting to the moon. It's just whatever light can sneak around through the Earth's atmosphere and get bent or scattered in the direction of the moon. So this is a perhaps a better illustration of what I was talking about before, the tilt of the moon's orbit affecting whether or not you get an eclipse. And you can only get an eclipse at the correct phase of the moon. So a, a solar eclipse can only happen at new moon when the moon is in front of the sun, and a lunar eclipse can only happen at full moon when the Earth is in front of the moon. That's an important thing to remember. And what you see is that this line of nodes only points towards the sun or away from the sun about every six months. So those are your only opportunities during the year to have an eclipse. It's not exactly every six months because the, the moon's orbit precesses, uh, it turns about once every 20 years, and that makes it somewhat more complicated to figure out when the eclipses are going to happen. This is just a, a time sequence illustration showing the, the, the moon during a, a total eclipse. Again, showing not only does it get redder, it gets much, much darker because you're only seeing that, that little bit of light that gets through. But I'm posing two questions here that I usually ask in class, but I'll, I'll talk about the answers right now. The first is, why do lunar eclipses happen more often than solar eclipses, and the answer to that is that the, the Earth's shadow is bigger than the Moon's shadow, and, and uh, so the, the Moon manages to get into the shadow of the Earth 
even when it's not exactly exactly on the line of nodes whereas is uh, it has to be much more precisely lined up if you're going to get a, a solar eclipse and why are lunar eclipses easier to see they're they're easier to see because everyone on the side of the earth s with the moon can during the eclipse gets to see it whereas a solar eclipse is only visible along a small band on the earth's surface Solar eclipses come in two flavors, total and annular eclipses. In a total eclipse, the entire disk of the sun is blocked by the moon. And in an annular eclipse, a small band at the edge of the sun is visible when the moon passes in, in front of it. The difference is caused by the very slight ellipticities, that is, that is non-circular shapes, of the moon's orbit and the, and the Earth's orbit. And depending upon exactly where we are in our orbit or where the moon is in its orbit, when the the moon passes in in, in front of the sun, and the and the uh, that line to the sun is on the on is also the line of nodes, uh, the angular size of the moon can be slightly larger or slightly more, smaller than the angular size of the sun. The moon is 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 of course very very much smaller than the sun, but it's also very very much closer, and it just happens that its angular size, the apparent size you see on the sky, is almost exactly the same as the apparent angular size of the sun. Now, I mentioned before that solar eclipses are only visible along a narrow band on the Earth's surface called the path of totality. And the reason for this is that exact match in angular sizes. As you move away from the center line of the line between the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, you're, it's like cocking your head to look around something that's blocking a view of something. You can start to see the Sun peek around because you're no longer in a zone where the Moon lines up well enough to block the entire surface and then you don't see a, a total eclipse. And the reason this doesn't happen just as a dot is that the moon is moving fairly slowly, the earth is turning fairly quickly, and so the position where this is true moves along a path while the eclipse is happening. Here's an illustration. This is not apes at the dawn of man. This is uh, scientists out to observe a total solar eclipse. And one, one thing you'll see is, of course, the, the, uh, just the corona of the sun peeking out past the moon at the top. That's why there's all that fuzziness. And the other thing you'll notice is that it's light on the horizon. And that's because within the path of totality, the sun's light is blocked. But outside of it, the sun is still partially visible, and it's daytime. So why do people want to look at total solar eclipses? One reason is to look at phenomena in the outer part of the sun's atmosphere. Here's a picture taken during a total eclipse of the sun showing prominences, that is, hot gas that's coming out from the surface of the sun on, on different sides. We can't see these normally when we're looking at the sun because the sun's surface, its photosphere, is so bright that it overwhelms the much fainter emission from these objects. If you simply block the sun with a disk on the surface of the Earth, then atmospheric turbulence and refraction in the atmosphere would bring much of that sunlight around that disk, and you still wouldn't get to see the solar prominences. So having the moon, which is outside the atmosphere, do the blocking for us, lets us study these atmospheric phenomena on the sun's surface with much greater detail than we could normally do. The solar corona is even fainter than the prominences you see there, and sometimes extends out to many times the diameter of the sun. This region is very hot gas, but it's very tenuous, so it's very, very faint. And if we want to see it, we have to wait again until the disk of the sun is blocked. And you thought a corona was just a beer. Another very important, at least historically very important, kind of observation that's done of the sun during solar eclipses are tests of general relativity. We'll talk about general relativity later, but one of the predictions that was very surprising that Einstein made due to the theory of, of, of general relativity was that strong gravitational objects would be able to bend the path of starlight and let stars appear somewhere other than where they should normally appear. 
But the problem is, although the sun is a massive object, it's so bright that you can't see stars that are very close to it on the sky. You have that opportunity, however, when the sun is blocked by the moon. So you take a picture of a star field where the sun will be six months later uh, during an eclipse and measure the position of the stars close to where the eclipse totality will take place and ones relative to ones farther away. And then when the sun is there, you take that picture again and you can, by comparing these two pictures, measure the bending of starlight. And this provided the first direct test of general relativity. It was done only a few years after Einstein published his theory in 1915. So a couple of questions that, that come up all the time. Why is it dangerous to look at a solar eclipse? The answer is, and, and most of you know this, that the sun emits harmful ultraviolet rays, and those rays can damage your retina and, and harm your, your vision. Most of those rays come from the, the, the very outer part of the atmosphere, so disproportionately from the chromosphere and corona of the sun, which are not blocked by the solar eclipse. Those rays are always present. They're present every day. They're present today in the light from the sun. But today, if you go out and look at the sun, it's so bright, it hurts your eyes after a few seconds and you look away. Plus, you've seen it every day and you don't want to look at it. Solar eclipses are interesting, and the fact that the disk is blocked makes it possible to look at the sun. And that's why you can accidentally expose yourself to much more of this strong ultraviolet light than you would normally, and why you should always use a proper device or a, a camera obscura to observe a solar eclipse. Almost every time when there's a total uh, eclipse of the moon, you'll hear some idiot reporter on the local TV station say, don't go outside and look at the eclipse of the moon tonight, it's dangerous. Actually, it's not dangerous at all. A lunar eclipse is completely harmless. In fact, it's fainter, of course, in every way than the moon is on a normal day, but it's the same light that's getting to you. It's just that they're remembering about the solar eclipses and telling you this. Let's move now from our discussion of eclipses to a discussion of this other important Earth-Moon phenomenon, that is the tides. Tides are caused by the difference in the gravitational field across the finite size of a body. In the case of the Moon and the Earth, the distance from the Earth to the Moon is not so many times larger than the size of the Earth that the gravitational forces are the same on both sides. What happens then in the presence of a liquid is that the, the oceans on the side of the Earth towards the Moon are, are being accelerated towards the Moon more quickly than the center of the Earth. So they, they bulge out. There's a net difference in force on the near oceans and the center of the Earth. Likewise, there's more uh, acceleration of the center of the Earth relative to the oceans on the far side. And so the Earth itself pulls away from those oceans. That's what gives us the tides twice a day. Now you might say, well, OK, I'm looking at this diagram. I see my tides. I see where the moon is. What do I need a tide table for? The reason you need a tide table is that the water can't respond instantly. In the open ocean, there's a slight delay between when the moon is directly overhead and when the high tide comes. But as you get into more confined bodies of water, it takes a while for the water to pour out through a channel into the main body of the ocean or back in through the channel. So the tides are, are delayed even more in that case, and that gives you the need for a tide table. Do places without water have tides? In other words, does the, does the actual land have a tide? The answer is yes. It's very, very small, so we don't really notice it, and we don't make note of it. And does the moon have tides? The answer there is, well, first of all, it's all land, so it's going to be smaller anyway. But second, it's the relative size of the body to the distance is a very powerful factor here. And since the moon is much smaller than the Earth, the tides on the moon are very much smaller than the Earth tides. When you have a body of water with the right shape, it can accentuate the effects of the tides. And in some cases, they can be very enormous. Here is the, the Bay of Fundy in Canada. And the tides can be as large as 17 meters at this point, 54-foot tidal difference between high and low tides. That's pretty amazing. Now, there's another phenomenon which is 
kind of neat, which is related to this delay and when the tide, when the tides happen, and that's what the phenomenon of tidal friction. Because the tidal bulge gets pulled ahead of the Earth line moon, and it's got a pull on it, and the pull on the near tidal bulge is larger than the pull on the far tidal bulge, it puts a torque on the Earth. It, it tends to drag on the Earth to slow it down. This is what's known as, as tidal friction. This illustration uh, perhaps gives you a better idea. The tidal bulge gets ahead and it gets pulled on, but since the near tidal bulge is, is, is closer, it gets pulled on more than the far tidal bulge, so getting pulled to slow down is more effective than getting pulled to speed up. And this tidal torque then which is very, very small, slows the Earth down, and actually over millennia, over millions of years, changes the, s s the length of the day. It changes the speed at which the Earth turns on its axis. The angular momentum from this gets transferred to the Moon, then, and the Moon moves out a tiny bit in its orbit as this happens. This is a well-known phenomenon, and, and you can actually show that this has happened by looking at fossils from hundreds of millions of years ago, where the fossils were, were from creatures growing, uh, corals in particular, growing up in tidal waters where there was a high tide and a low tide every day, and that affected the, the growth, and then the sunlight every day affected the growth. And you can see rings for each day within the rings that are caused in the tidal growth, in the coral growth over the entire year. And counting up the number of rings, you find that there were more than 365 days because the days were shorter than they are now. The Earth turned on its axis much more quickly, and this tidal friction has slowed it down. That's a pretty amazing phenomenon.